The entrenched image of an African woman holding a hoe or carrying a basket of fruit on her head has become a symbol of women in agriculture industry in Africa. In reality, they deserve much more credit than this depiction. According to reports from many research institutions, Africa's agricultural business will be worth $1 trillion by the year of 2030, and this estimate does not include supporting industries such as rural energy, transport, irrigation, and telecommunications infrastructure. As an important part of the global supply chain, these industries employ millions of African women who are often being overlooked. In a previous episode, we talked about how the trifecta of climate change the COVID-19 pandemic and the Ukraine-Russia conflict exacerbated food prices in Africa. As a result, the need to feed a continent with 1.4 billion people is unprecedentedly urgent. Fortunately, we've seen many young people in Africa and in the diaspora, especially women, choose to dive into agribusiness with creative and innovative solutions. This has drawn a contrast to the often negative and stereotypical perception of agriculture, especially by the younger generation. Hello, I'm Amina Aliyu and this is Our Voices. On today's program, we'll take a closer look at the misrepresentation of African women in agriculture and how many of them are shaping the industry through innovations and creativities. And the new name we give them is Agri-Entrepreneurs. In Ghana, a modified coffee seedling and new farming practices are helping the country achieve steady growth in coffee production, which had declined markedly over the past decade. Women farmers are taking the lead in producing coffee. Senano Todd reports from Accra, Ghana. Scientists at Ghana's Cocoa Research Institute say they have developed two new varieties of coffee seedlings that are very promising. They, they are very high yielding and then they are relatively um, tolerant, I will not say resistant, tolerant to pests and diseases as well as moisture stress. And then they have uh, what we call good cup quality about their drinking. They taste very well. Experts say the new seedlings are reviving Ghana's coffee industry and that women are playing a big part in that growth. Industry figures show the number of women farmers has jumped by 22% in the last five years. The new varieties are specific to Ghana's environment, says growers, and more likely to produce good yields. What that does for our women farmers in particular is that they are able to farm robusta without breaking their backs because now the effort that is put into it is less. The number of coffee bean production facilities has also increased, lowering the amount of green beans being exported for production. A number of local roosters have come into the system and so the export has dwindled to a point where almost no coffee was being exported because the local roosters were picking up everything. So you see the numbers for exports have really gone down, but not necessarily the production itself. Industry researchers say more than half of Ghana's 15 new coffee roasting companies are owned by women who pay more for the beans from local farmers than exporters do. Coffee roaster Amy Beth uses Ghanaian spices and flavors on her products. They are then sold in local markets or exported abroad, including the US and Europe. You could see that the coffee, coffee culture was growing. People also had access to global markets, so they were traveling, they were experiencing coffee, and they were understanding the usefulness of coffee in general. So it was very obvious to me that that revolution was coming to Ghana, and it was important for us to position ourselves in a manner in which we could also be a game changer in the coffee industry globally. According to the UN Food and Agricultural Organization, trade in coffee makes up the largest part of tropical beverages, even more than cocoa and tea. The Ghanaian government says its goal is to continue growing coffee to outperform the country's cocoa production, or at least match it to generate more income. Sana Anutod for VOA News, Accra, Ghana. Coffee production is not the only industry where producers are seeking alternative solutions. VOA producer Abby Sun recently spoke with Dr. Esther Ibrahim, 
Program Officer at Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, a network led by Africans to promote unique solutions to sustainably boost production and gain access to rapidly growing agriculture markets. As we know, in Africa, there are an estimated 33 million smallholder farms, and the farmers that live on them contribute to 70% of the food supply. One of the missions of the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa is agriculture transformation with smallholder farms front and center. How does this organization achieve the goal from your experience? Agra actually partners with government, private sector, and other development partners. Uh, investing in a catalytic interventions that uh, lead to systemic change uh, in critical agricultural uh, market systems in countries where they operate and uh, to see how they can uh, package technology innovations uh, that can actually uh, uh, boost uh, farmers' productivity and actually uh, develop the system entirely, not just looking at it from one point, uh, it's end-to-end, uh, to see that uh, the agricultural uh, sector is actually uh, grown and uh, able to sustain itself. So that's the bigger picture that Agra is looking at. I want to touch upon the technology component of your work and the female representation in the agriculture sector. Um, could you tell me a little bit about of your personal experience and have you seen the change of female representation um, because of technology? Um, the way the uh, system, the way the current issues that we are looking at, looking at climate change and other externalities, external shocks and factors that actually affect uh, productivity of farmers, it is uh, expedient that we actually look into uh, technologies and innovations that can actually support and cushion the effect and make farmers more resilient starting from seed. Seed for farmers is one of the very important components of our production. And so we work in hand in hand with the private sector, the seed companies, the national governments, our research institutes to see how we can come up with climate smart varieties that are uh, flood tolerant, that are uh, resistant to diseases and also able to stand uh, weather shocks, you know, and then also looking at uh, post-harvest technologies that can also support uh, farmers in uh, adding value to their product, even after harvesting. So across the chain, all those are happening. And when you come to areas of finance, uh, mobile money, it's something that uh, it's been promoted uh, uh, seriously now so that even using your small phones that are a bit smart, you can actually sit in the corner of your rooms and you're able to you know, request for things. A sizable number of women actually participate in agricultural production. I see that Agra is working so hard and so much that women are not marginalized in their intervention. And then uh, they've come up with uh, um, several um, uh, initiatives that can actually help uh, women in agribusiness you know, be more productive, more efficient, and they're able to connect. The value for her platform is one. We have the African Women uh, uh, Award for Young Women in Agribusiness. The uh, Arise, that's uh, having a women, uh, resili African resilience and uh, leadership for uh, um, agribusiness executives. You know, all those things are put in place. Their platforms, their programs, the Women to Women Supply Program. You know, just to see that on the continent, women have voices and women have access to productive resources that can make them contribute more to the economies of uh, 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 the different countries where they are represented. I want to talk about the Africa Food Trade and Resilience Initiative. Um, the goal of this um, initiative is to address food shortage through regional food production and boosting the um, trade volume within the continent. Um, can you tell me more about this? Yes, so uh, the regional food trade is um, actually an instrument that uh, is supposed to help uh, for, those, um, for us to have good information. Data is very important for decision making. You know, if you do not have accurate data, you cannot make decisions for uh, uh, the food uh, system as a whole. So I agree uh, is working 
in this front to see how we can, uh, it, it started actually collating data uh, and then uh, analyzing it uh, to share market information, trade information across uh, international, national and uh, regional you know, uh, uh, space so that uh, we are able to know exactly what's happening across uh, the space and then they are able to you know, government can make decisions, can make uh, uh, policies that can actually facilitate, you know, having quality food from one section, one part of the country to another. And then we are developing the food systems in a way that is catalytic and it's more efficient that, yes, what is not available in Nigeria, we can get it from Mali. What is not available in Kenya, you can actually, you know, through information that is actually robust, you are able to get it in another part. So this is uh, actually what we are doing, working from the farmer level up to the institutional level. Do you have an idea for boosting local agriculture produce? Please share your views on our social media platforms. We are on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Our handle is at VOA Our Voices. We are also on WhatsApp. Our number is on your screen. It's time for a break. When we come back, We'll introduce you to a lady in the United States whose business was inspired by her experience in Africa. She is now stirring up opportunities for rural women in West Africa. We will be right back. Empowerment and humanity towards a better world. Economic and social progress of every society. Facts and information from key players rather than spectators in politics, business, Science and Technology. City, rural, educated, all underprivileged. We care and we listen to what matters to you. Your, Your voices, voices are our voices. Welcome back. You're watching Our Voices. This week, we are featuring African agricultural entrepreneurs who are actively making efforts to boost or maintain local produce through innovative ideas and to empower women in the industry and shedding light on those who are often being overlooked. Rahama Wright is the founder and CEO of Shea Yaleen, a social enterprise for producing Shea Butter skincare products that empower women in West Africa. Seven years ago, Wright was inspired by her Peace Corps volunteer experience in West Africa, where she found out that women who were producing the Shea Butter we're barely making a living. And these women count for an important component in the global supply chain of shea butter. My colleagues in Demiaki and Orien and I talked with Rahama Wright about her journey. Ms. Rahama Wright, it's such a pleasure and such an honor to have you uh, join our conversation today. And uh, we are talking about agripreneurs and you fall right into that category. So as we speak, you're the, you're the president and the CEO of Shea Yaleen. Can you tell us a little bit about your company and the product that you sell? What my company, Shailene, does is really simple. We help women take an agricultural product called Shea. It's actually, I can show you all. This is the seed. And contained in this seed is an oil. And contained in that oil is all these moisturizing and nourishing benefits for skin and hair. So what we do is we help women take these seeds, transform it into products like soaps, creams, moisturizers that we connect to the U.S. marketplace. And by doing that, we increase women's income five times their country's minimum wage, giving them a living wage for the very first time. So Rahama, you were a Peace Corps volunteer, and now you head this company, Shayeline, and your products can be found in some of the largest U.S. retail stores, such as Whole Foods and Macy's. How did you get started? I started it because of the women, um, the African women who are part of this global supply chain. I'm African on my mom's side. And just seeing a lot of the disconnects between what happens locally in these communities and how that translates into the global marketplace, that's the reason why I started Shailene. You know, I often say I figured out how to start my business on Google. I would Google questions and it would take me down a certain path and then I would adjust. I would reach out to people, cold call them. And if I were to give anyone three pieces of advice or even two pieces of advice when they're first starting out their, their business, the one is just learn. Learn the industry that you're a part of. Understand what you're bringing to that industry. So for me, 
I knew about shea. I knew that it was an agricultural product. I knew that it was something that women in Africa made, but I didn't know how to bring it to market. So I spent a lot of time learning about, okay, how can I get the right packaging? How can I get the right quality? Uh, and the second thing would be build your network. Absolutely. I would cold call people, send people, you know, messages that emails who didn't know me, but if I felt like there was possibility for alignment, I would reach out to people and building and cultivating those relationships over those years led me to getting my first round of capital, led me to getting my first Whole Foods account, which then gave, put me in a position where I was able to get into MGM. And then last year is when we launched in Macy's. That is so awesome because you said that you learned it from Google and I'm sure a lot of women who are listening are doing the same thing. I was saying, oh, I guess it's not that bad, you know, getting free courses <laughs> to start a business. It's really encouraging. Now you say you're in Ghana right now, which is really amazing. And you work directly with women who are actually, you know, in the shea butter industry and you really help them to even come to the U.S. to see who they sell their products to how yeah. why did you decide to do that and help them come to the U.S. to see that and how is that experience I'm sure everyone here has a connection to Africa I'm just assuming and you know that oftentimes our community members don't have the same opportunity to see the world the same way we have been able to mm -hmm. and a lot of women who are in the agricultural space they are typically harvesters they're not creating value-added processed products that can connect to the marketplace. And so even though the supply chain starts with them, they're completely disconnected from formal markets. And they don't get a chance to be exposed to what it's like to walk into a store, see a product that they were a part of. And so that was really important for me. I wanted the women in our community to not only experience the market side and get a chance to walk into a whole food store, meet a buyer, talk to a customer, touch the, you know, the products on the shelf and see how people even interacted with the products. Because for me, if we're going to transform supply chains and transform the way things are extracted out of Africa, we have to give people the ability to see how big the market is and not only see how big it is, but also see that they are contributing to this very large market. What we're doing is not a handout. We're, you know, not teaching a foreign concept and bringing it into the community. These women have been making this product for hundreds of years, yet these very large foreign companies benefit from their labor. Mm -hmm. It's not fair. And for me, this is about economic justice. You mentioned a lot about um, the efforts that you're making and um, how you're actively trying to change these women's lives. Um, how have the products themselves improved the lives of the people you have been working with? And how exactly do you measure um, that improvement? So for Shailene and for me, my goal is when I go into a community and I work with a group, if they are not making living wages, we are not making our impact. And that is the single, to me, the best thing you can do for a woman is give her access to more income and access to choices, better choices. And so that's how we measure impact. So we start with looking at government data in terms of what is the minimum wage in this country? So that's published information, right? Anyone can find that. We then interview the women that we work with. What are you making now? What would you like to be making in terms of how much does it cost you to live? And you know that you're not just making ends meet, you actually have a little bit left over to save. And we collect that information. So women talk about the cost of sending their kids to school. They talk about transportation costs, food costs, electricity, access to water, all of those things. And from that, we've developed a multiplier of five against the minimum wage. And so the women that we work with, they're making more than nurses. They're making more than teachers. They're making more than construction workers within the, the, the country because of that multiplier of five. And when you ask, well, how does that improve their lives? It improves their lives dramatically. 
some of the things we've been able to see women in our cooperatives do, not only the number one thing they do is ensure that their kids are in school. Like, it doesn't matter if it's a boy child or a girl child, 100%. That's the one thing moms really, really care about this issue of educating their kids. The other things is that they are able to invest in other income generating activities. We're not trying to create shape producers for the rest of their lives, right? We're not trying to have a woman be a shea producer from her 20s all the way till she's 80 years old. And a lot of women who work in shea are elder. They're older women who oftentimes are widows. So what we try to do is create a model where people are able to make enough money, more than enough money, so that they can do other things. And then that kind of term creates a cycle of bringing new people in. And then they're able to make enough money to do other things and then bring new people in. And so that's the cycle that we're, the cycle of change that we're committed to. It's time for another quick break. When we come back, we'll introduce you to two women-owned businesses in Africa taking things up a notch to sustain their operation in the supporting industry of food and agriculture. We'll be right back. This is a country that I chose to become a citizen. I didn't have to become a citizen. I chose to become a citizen. I feel like America gave me an opportunity to pursue my passion as an artist. I really believe that clean eating is, is a way to a more successful life or, or a happier life, if, if you want to put it that way. One of the things that helps me wake up every morning is doing better, being better. We grew up poor, and so I'm always focused on helping the working class be able to have a more comfortable lifestyle. I'm passionate about doing justice every day. Um, I oftentimes say that justice is a verb, not a noun. You know, I believe in action and moving the ball forward. Welcome back. You're watching Our Voices. It's time for our Women to Watch segment. A women's cooperative in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo has found success selling thousands of bars of soap made from coffee. David Doyle has more. If you're a fan of the smell of a fresh brew in the morning, then this might be the soap for you. It's made from coffee by a women's cooperative in Democratic Republic of Congo. And it's a product that has been a big success, says Hashima Coffee's founder, Solange Kwija Kahiriri. It takes about three weeks to make the coffee soaps. We make about 5,000 soaps in a week. For now, our soaps can be found in five provinces in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Kahiriri used to work in communications, but was introduced to the coffee industry by a client. In 2018, she founded the entrepreneurship group in Congo's East. She says it's created a source of income for 1,500 women and young people. It's not an easy job for women. If you look at the coffee sector, there are not many women. Women only work in the fields, but are part of the commercial process. It's still very much a male-dominated field. The cooperative produces coffee as well as the soaps. It gives out free coffee plant seedlings and connects members to fair trade buyers once beans have been harvested and processed. The soaps are made at a Hashima-owned factory in Bukavu. 100 women work there, among them Maman and Samire. I am able to put food on the table thanks to this association, so it is very good. There are challenges. Kahiriri says poor road infrastructure for transporting coffee beans, regular electricity outages and a lack of funding are the main issues. She says they could do even greater things if they had more financial support. In Kenya's capital Nairobi, restaurant owner Miriam Kamau 
is one of about 200,000 customers of four-year-old Kenyan company Coco, which has replaced fuels such as charcoal, kerosene, and liquefied petroleum gas with locally produced ethanol. Large blue ATMs installed by Coco has been popping up across Nairobi, but they are not dispensing cash. Instead, they give out clean cooking fuel. Restaurant owner Miriam Kumayu says she has been operating the business for eight years, and it's been four years since she adopted to cocoa fuel. I think I was among the first people in this area to use it when they came into the market. I don't even know the price of cooking gas anymore. The locally produced ethanol is both good for the environment and safe to use than traditional wood and kerosene, says Michael Wokoli the head of fuel operations of the four-year-old company, Coco. I am using the waste of the product that was used to make sugar and molasses and so on to create something that I can still reutilize it again and recycle it. So all in a way to try and also meet up with the climatic requirements we have now, the climate conditions now we've known we have destroyed quite a bit of our forest coverage and so on and so forth. Ethanol from agricultural waste helps cut down on greenhouse emissions partially because consumers won't be using charcoal made from cutting down trees. The United Nations Environmental Program also says sugarcane bioethanol can reduce emissions by 40 to 62 percent, compared to petroleum-derived fuels. But for Coco's customers, it's also about cost. <laughs> It has really helped me because cooking gas cost me a thousand Kenya shillings to refill. But with cocoa, I can get even a hundred shillings worth of fuel. Kenya has given ethanol producers like cocoa who use sugar processing waste an exemption from its 16% fat. That's to encourage ethanol production to grow in tandem with the sugar industry, one of Coco's common crops. Coco plans to expand to another 10 Kenyan towns in the near future. Well, we'll have to stop right here for this week's show. If you would like more information on today's program, go to our website at voaafrica.com. On behalf of my Our Voices colleagues and everyone here at The Voice of America, I'm Amina Eliyu. Until next time, stay safe.